All right, so here's what I'm gonna do, Ruth, since it's you. I'm gonna go through these questions one by one. Okay. And you and I can just talk and we'll go through as many as we can. If somebody else comes on, they get dibs on questions. So, okay. sound good? Where's Lance? Yeah, where's Lance? No, he doesn't care, man. He figures I've got this. <laughs> he, tells me, he tells me he wants me on this thing, and then, he, and then he doesn't show up. Yeah, well, he's probably drinking a pour-over coffee at whatever, HQ, <laughs> drinking something that's like $10 coffee. All right. <laughs> I'm going to start at the top of these, Roof, and I would say when I'm done, or if I say my piece and you want to chime in and we want to talk, we can do this however we want, okay? Okay. All right, so number one, what skills do you think young coaches first need to learn? So here is going to be my answer, and I'm thinking about this from the intern slash new coach perspective. So like, when an intern comes into the gym, I don't care if they're 18 years old, if they're 21, if they're 29, because we've had you know all age ranges. The first thing I need them to learn, I don't care about them coaching, none of that. The first thing I want them to learn is how to interact with our clients. Okay. Like number one, you gotta know how to interact with people. And this is something that we always come back to is like the first two weeks of your internship, there's literally no coaching demands at all. And I don't care if you've coached for like five years before because you may coach things well, but we probably have a different standard at IFAST than what you've done in the past. And that's not to sound like snooty or conceited. It's just we have a certain way of doing things and we want to be cohesive in how it's taught. Right. So the most important thing is those first two weeks, you have to be able to relate to people. You got to know people. You got to know their first name. You got to know some stuff about them. You got to be able to create a relationship with them first because then it's infinitely easier to coach them once you know the person, not just an exercise. So that is my two cents on that. What do you think, Roof? I, I, I got different. I don't know. We're, we're uh, probably going at the, at the same place, but I got a little, go a little it, different man. perspective. And that is how to read people. Okay. Okay. So, um, and I, I, I know this comes with experience of different things, but you, you know, we don't, we don't spend enough time teaching people how to read people. You know, you, you have coaches and then you have what I call legends. Yeah. Okay. And the coaches are the guys, yeah, they win and they win national championships and all these other things. But the legends are the ones that people remember. The legends are the ones that affected your life. And they, they may have won national championships. It may be big schools. They may not have been. Okay. But we don't. Um, uh, but they're the guys that people come back to see. I can remember just a quick story. Yeah. You know, I got stories as usual. Love stories. And so we had, we had a guy at, at IU when I was there. His name <laughs> was Howard Brown. He played there and he coached there for 25 or 30 years. He was, he, he was an institution. Everybody loved Coach Brown. And I remember sitting in the office one day, and 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 Corso couldn't fire him when he first came in because he was a legend, right? He's one of these right. guys you, you keep around. And, and I remember on game day one day sitting there and uh, seeing all these people file down the hallway in assembly hall where the office was. And there was a huge line waiting, and I was sitting with one of the other coaches, and he goes, you know. He said, that's how you can tell a coach. And I looked at him. I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, you see that line? That's all for one man. It's Coach Brown. That's how much he affected those people. That's cool. All old players that came back 
to, to see the see the head guy. Or not, I mean, I'm sorry, not the head guy. Coach Brown was never the head coach; he was the assistant coach. But he affected so many people that they waited in line to see him on game day when they when they would come back. He when he died, he died while I was still in school. It was I remember they um, we, we went to funeral of course. It was a who's who of coaches. Woody Hayes was there. Bo Schembechler, Joe Paterno, John McKay flew in from USC. Wow. Coaches from all over the country were there. Literally, it was a who's who of college coaches at the time. And I can yeah. stand there looking and, God dang, you know, what, what impact this guy must have made. Yeah. And nobody talks about that anymore. Yeah. It's true, man. It's true. You, can have, you, can, you can have all the coaching knowledge you want. And get to know the people, but until you start impacting them, know how to read them so that you can impact them, it doesn't mean anything. You're just going to be a coach. You're not going to be a legend. That's awesome, man. I love that. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's great, man. That's great. It's our show, Roof. It's just us. Okay. Number two. Oh, I'm going to let all hang out then. So. Yeah, man. <laughs> okay. So here's the next question. It says, is not there. Recording, by the way, are you? What's the heck? You're not, you're not recording this, by the way, are you? This is just me and you, but yeah, we're recording it, of course. All right, All right. go ahead. Question number two. Is there a way you can inspire young, shy kids to break out of their shell and take initiative? So, stories aren't as good as roofs, but I will give you guys some inside baseball. Like, if you knew me 20 plus years ago, definitely was not the personality that I have now. It was in there, but it definitely wasn't on display. And it definitely wasn't there when I was on the floor. And that's because I don't care how good you are, how many X's and O's you know, the one thing that it takes to feel really comfortable if you are a shy or more introverted person on a gym floor is time, right? There's just no way you can get around being comfortable and like this is one thing that I always come back to is when we talk about introverts as coaches, man, some of the best coaches out there are introverts. They are a little bit more analytical. They're not naturally like super outgoing or engaging, but what they learn over time is they learn how to take on those traits when they're on the floor. Okay. So man, again, I'm not like the most extroverted person by any stretch of the imagination. Like if we're just out and about, I would much rather have, let Roof or Bill or whoever hold court. I'm happy to sit back and just listen to them talk. I'm totally fine with that. Um, but again, you almost have to like switch gears. And I think introverts that are coaches that are successful know that they have to do that at some level. And you'll, you may never be like the rah, rah, super motivational guy. I don't think you necessarily have to be that. You have to find your coaching character if you will or your coaching personality that fits you but you have to be able to dial it up a notch and you have to be a little bit more extroverted a little bit more outgoing when you're on the floor so that you can be successful and so that you can create connections with people um roof what do you think shy kids young coaches not comfortable with themselves yet how do you get them to come out of their shell a little bit are, are you talking about kids you talking about athletes you talking about coaches no i'm talking coaches okay okay I think you you, um, you you have to put them in the, in, in the situation, okay? Um, you know, we had a great example yesterday where um, uh, Eric asked me to do his class while Bill well, he watched Bill do an assessment. And I said, sure. And we were sitting in the office talking, and I said, why don't you let Josh do it? You know, I mean, that's what he's there for. Right. And so Eric said, oh, that's a great idea. So he goes up out and talks to him and he said you know josh was was really scared he was all bug-eyed and everything you know and and, and, and uh you know he said, he said his eyes got like this big you know and all this kind of stuff so we're, of course we're laughing right because we know it's right. gonna happen and josh went out and did a a a very good job yeah you know now, you know was was it was it uh uh you know, was it earth, earth changing? No, but I think for, and I haven't talked to him since then, but there was only a couple times where I had to call him over and say, cause I was sitting there watching 
and you know, hey, you might want to do this at this time. Yep. You know, but that that's experience, right? Absolutely. And so, and but other than that, I thought he commanded the class well. There's some things I would have done a little bit differently, but again, it's my personality. But but sure. Josh, and this is not the running down, but you know, he's got that quiet personality that you know doesn't want to take over. And he had six or eight kids there, and yeah. you know, he was. He, it, it was fine. Yeah. You know, I was waiting for him to, to fail. I was going to have to get up, get my fat ass up out of the chair and, <laughs> and uh, you know, go help him and bail him out. But at no point the whole hour did I have to. That's great. And, and, and it was good. He knew I was sitting there watching him. Of course, Jason's coming over to peek around the corner to watch him. Yep. You know, and I thought, I thought he did, you know, a good job of ignoring all that and just yeah. doing what he was told to do. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other one, the other great one, I think, you know, is, is, uh, is uh, Jason when he spoke at, uh, at the, yeah. uh, at the Summit little thing. Oh yes. yeah. Remember he gave, he gave it the first time in the purple room and he gets admitted into it and you guys start killing him. <laughs> for an hour. I mean, you guys chopped them up bad. I'd have, I'd have just crawled out of the thing, you know, and I'd, ne I'd never showed back up to iFast. <laughs> you know? But he goes and practices it, and he gets up Saturday, and he did he did great. Yeah. Was it the exact speech that he wanted? No. But he did great. Looked like he'd been talking, you know, done this a hundred times. Absolutely. And you he have to – he probably gave it to you at least a hundred by himself. So well, yeah, that one night I wouldn't let him leave, and he was afraid at <laughs> two in the morning, and he finally got it right. Yeah, but 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 you know, there again, you know, it's 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 uh, um, it's it's put him on the spot, and you know, one little cool thing that we did with him, excuse me, that I learned was just grab the guy and say, "Here, coach, this." You don't, you don't give him time to think about what he's going to say. Here, yeah. you coach it, you know, or here, you give us this, this talk, right? You got, you got five minutes to talk about this, this, uh, uh, this topic. Yeah. Right? You're going to make it or you're going to fail. Yeah. Right? If you're tough enough, you're going to stay there, take your lumps like Jason did, yeah. and, and, and you're going to come back. And, you know, I think, you know, and that, that's, a, that's a fun little game to play with them. You know, here you coach this. I'm gonna stand here. You know, it's it's not like you know stepping out on on off the cliff with no safety rope because you're standing there, right? Right. It's still a little nerve wrack wracking. Here you go. You coach this RDL or you coach this power cleaner. You know, whatever it is, whatever the exercise. And I think I think you know I don't think we do that enough. Yeah. You know, to put to put them in those situations and that kind of draws them out, kind of builds them confidence. You know, yeah. and, then, and then you don't you don't do it in front of the client, but you take him back later, and you and, you know then you chop him up after that. Yeah. But yeah, one thing I've always tried to do too is, <clears throat> you know, if I'm trying to make somebody me me more comfortable on the floor and kind of running the show, is once I know they're ready, I will deliberately not be on the floor when they're coaching, because right. two things happen. Number one, if a coach is or if a, a client is out there and they're used to me, if they have a question, they're gonna to come to me, right? Mm -hmm. I know, I know the answer. I wanna know if they know the answer. So that's number one. That's a really good point, yeah. Number two is, as the coach, a lot of times you're not thinking about coaching, you're thinking about how is Mike judging me as a coach, right? right? Like yeah. you need that time to kind of expand yourself and just kind of like do things on your own and get more comfortable in your own rap and how you do things, so man. It's such a great point. Like at some point when you know they're ready, you have to let them sink or swim a little bit because that's when they make, they make mistakes, but that's what helps them get better. I think I, I don't know as I'd, as I'd even wait that long. Yeah. Well, when I know I'm ready. Yeah. Cause you're never ready. Never ready. Sure. Right. At yeah. least I don't think so. No, I agree. So you're, you're only ready after you go through that. Yeah, for sure. You know, so, so I really like that point, you know, just walk away yep. or walk out of the room or whatever. And that's great. And, 
you don't have to tell them. You just, you know, here, coach this. I got to go to the bathroom. Walk out, yeah. And then, and then you take the world's longest pee, right? <laughs> so, so you're gone for 15 minutes, and now the guy's stuck. You know, yeah. things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 but that's a great point. The only, the only thing I would say is I don't know if you're ever ready until you do it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, then, and then you get in. I can remember when I first went to Center Grove, and Marty grabs me out of the hallway, and he goes, here, coach 60 kids on how to do a split jerk. What? I've never coached 60 kids before. <laughs> right? <laughs> he just yeah. stood there. You know, and here I am looking around at all these kids like I'm an idiot. Yeah. You know? And, and, out, though, I'm uh, sure. Yeah, but, you know, now, you know, I've been coaching a long time, so I, you know, figured it out. But, but I mean, yeah. you got to be put in those situations. For and sure. Then, and then, you know, you go back in and, and you know, after the, after the session's over or whatever – and then you go back and you talk to them and you tell them stories. And one thing these guys got to learn is that you got to be a great listener. Yeah. Because people will tell you stories that have great meaning. Yeah. You know, you know get, getting back to, to legends. You know, I, I played for what I consider legend. I mean, most of the guys I know still call him coach. You know, and he says, you can call me Louis. No, we're your coach. You know? Right. And, and, you know, I've told you about him before, but, but you know, if I, I, you know, on Friday nights, we have this little dinner, Jason and I and Kyle Moran and a couple other guys. And, and so I brought him to dinner one time and, and I told the guys, I said, shut up and listen and you'll learn something. We got there at seven thirty and left at twelve thirty, and coach was still going. Right, they finally kicked us out of the saloon. And and but the stories he was telling were talking about leadership and how you lead men. And he was just telling the stories. You yeah. Know? What we didn't start on a topic or anything like that. But that's but that's how the stories. You know, it, that's the stories evolved into that, and he would tell the stories and you know how how uh, uh, you know great leaders work and all all the other things. And so, you know, they, they got the, the young ones got to shut up and listen to the old guys. You know, even yep. though, God, here comes another story. Right. You might pick up something. Yep, for sure. For sure. Sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. All right, gentlemen, I see a name of Brian, but I don't know which one of you is Brian. You guys got questions? You're here. We're here. We're here. We are here. Well, we are here. Stuff I can answer, but what do you guys want to talk about? All right, so um, hi, I'm Brian. This is Francis. He's actually my, my lead coach here at Thrive Fit. We're in Toronto, Canada. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, so we're starting to scale our business, and we have a bunch of young coaches who are coming on board, and yeah. we finally got some onboarding going. Um, but yeah. we're trying to understand what that first year looks like and like, how long should onboarding, onboarding be? Should we structure their learning for the first year? We want to get some information on how to handle young coaches coming in. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we've tried a few different methods. Some have worked, some haven't, and we're trying to get a bit more consistent. Yeah. So great question. And I'll give you, I'll kind of give you a rundown of like what our internship looks like, right? Because this is four months. Um, the first two weeks is literally client interactions only, right? Like I don't want you coaching a client. I don't want you doing anything other than setting up and tearing down equipment um, trying to get everybody's first name down, getting personal information and obviously, you know, to an appropriate amount, right? But like, hey man, you know, tell me about you. What's your job like? Do you have kids? Tell me about what do you do in your free time? What do you enjoy? So like trying to build that relationship and build that rapport. That's the first two weeks. And then it's, it's literally like graded exposure, right? What, sorry. I was just going to say, so that's the time on the floor. Now, is there anything going on on the back end during oh, those yeah. first two weeks? Yeah, so um, shameless product plug, but like physical prep 101, like the, the product that I created, we try and get them to watch that. In, in a perfect world, they watch it before they start. But if nothing else, they're going through like a module a day, right? right. So about an hour a day. And then what we're going to do is um, we're going to also be teaching that live. So like, let's say your goal is to watch the whole video on squatting on Monday, right? Or whatever day it is. Like two days later, what we're going to do, we're going to go in the gym. You're going to teach it back to me. Okay. 
So this is a totally different context versus if it's just me spewing information to them, then yeah, they'll take some in and they may not. But the whole dynamic is different when they're taking notes on something, yeah. writing it down. Now they have to put it in their words. They got to teach it back to me. So they got to be able to explain what's important to them or what's pertinent to them. And then the last piece of that puzzle is they've got to actually coach one of our coaches through the progression. Okay. okay? So, you know, depending on how you do things, like we have an entire squat progression, right? Like yeah. if we just taught the back squat, maybe that's all we would do, but I want to give them like five exercises that they can start with, right? Like plate squat, goblet squat, two kettlebell front squat, front squat, back squat. So like, let's say those are the five. All yeah. right, now you got to coach one of us through each one. Through all five of them. Absolutely. So now they're starting to understand, okay, well, why is that progression the way that it is? What are the unifying themes in a squat? What are the things that differentiate each variation and the things you need to focus on there? So that is, that's like the first two weeks is just the client interactions. And then generally in your guys' case, if you're onboarding people, it'll probably be a little bit faster, but I would say you probably want to go through one or two of those per week, right? It just depends on how fast you want them to get up to speed. Um, again, in the internship program, it's like one a week, right? So, hey, we're going to talk about breathing and core training on week one. So you're going to watch the video. You're going to teach it to us. Then we're going to go on the floor and we're going to coach it. Okay. So, and we literally, like, that could be your first 12 reads, right? Yeah. So you think breathing and core training. Um, Jay does a really good talk on just, like, coaching and cueing yeah. that he gives the first week that's, you know, external versus internal cues, feeling muscles versus focusing on outcomes. Then we go breathing and core training, squatting, hinging, split stance, single leg. We get into uh, horizontal pushing and pulling, vertical pushing and pulling. And then we can get into some of the bigger topics, right? So like program design, that's two weeks. Um, conditioning is another week. And then a lot of times what we like to do as well. Now keep in mind, this whole time they've been teaching back to us. Mm -hmm. right and that kills two birds with one stone number one it makes sure that they actually know what they're talking about yeah right but number two it starts to get them confident in their communication skills because you guys know as well as i do you could have like like the most technically yeah. sophisticated coach but you have to be able to communicate it to another human being <clears throat> so they're constantly getting practice and they're constantly getting reps in that environment and then towards the end we'll start like okay we phase them into coaching more. And so maybe it's just, okay, you're going to take Betty through her warm up, right? And then once they look really good in the breathing and the warm ups and the core stuff, okay, that's a little bit more simplistic. Now, maybe two to four weeks in, now we're going to start letting you take, because we do semi private training here, yeah. we're going to let you take one person through their workout. We're still going to supervise you, but basically instead of one on four with one coach, you're going to take this one client. We're going to take the other three. We'll still keep an eye on you, but you're going to be just like one-on-one -on -one with this person. What kind of, uh, what kind of model do you guys do there? Is it one-on-one -on -one group? So we're one to three. Okay. So I love that format, but we also know that if you've ever done one-on-one, -on -one, the hardest part is being able to carry a conversation for a full hour. Right. <laughs> so I like, I like putting them in that environment, right? Like, hey, dude, a minute never feels longer than when you have nothing to talk about with somebody. Yeah. So I've done that. Like I did in home for three years. I did rehab for three years before that. And so I know what it's like to be in that environment in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And you have to try and find points of connection, yeah. right? That go beyond just what you're doing in the gym. Like, that's great. You know, how did you feel? Okay. Okay, well, now I've still got 58 seconds to talk to you about stuff. So it's the interpersonal skills. So that's kind of how we layer it in. And then we just progressively give them more and more responsibility in that context, right? So, okay, you did one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, now can you handle two people at the same time, yeah. right? So now it's not just the interaction. It's how can you start to manage a session, right? Because you know hey, this person's doing one thing, this person's doing another. And in a perfect world, one is working while one is resting, but it doesn't always work like that. So that's how we kind of layer and phase it in. And then 
we just like Ruth and I were talking about when you guys popped on, it's like just progressively putting them in different situations and making them comfortable, right? So it's one-on-one, it's small group. If you do any large group, somebody's real quiet and shy, perfect. I'm going to go make you run our boot camp tonight. <laughs> and you're going to have to project, and I'm going to crank the music up, and we're, you're going to have to project over the music and people sweating and grunting and talking, and, you know, we'll see what you can do, you know? And one of the things, I wouldn't do this day one, but maybe like a couple months in, if you do have that person, a couple things that we'll do to try and get people more comfortable is we will – like our gym is like 90 feet long. So like 30, 35 meters. We'll make them stand on one end of the gym and the client will be on the opposite end. And you have to coach them from one end of the gym to the other. Okay. So now you've got to project, right? You've got to project. Um, another thing that we'll do, and we've done this in like staff trainings is literally they'll be coaching and they'll kind of be quiet and I'll literally go over and I'll turn the music up as loud as I can <laughs> and just, I'm just messing with them. Like, Hey, this may be a situation. The gym's busy. It's loud. Can you project? Can you get your point across? So it's just constantly after you've got like the base foundation, then it becomes way more individualized. Right. And it's like, okay, what does this person need? And sometimes they need more interpersonal skills. Sometimes they need to learn to be a little bit more confident, a little bit more, uh, boombastic if you will and just like hey project your voice put yourself out there um some people just need more x's and o's type training you know yeah. so that would be kind of our model and then i don't know if you guys asked this as well but like how do you continue to evolve and grow that um what we do now because again everybody we're in a unique situation because pretty much everybody that works here is interned for us so we know not only that they've got the technical skills, but from a team perspective, that the chemistry is going to be right. Right. I don't know how big your guys' staff is right now, but there's nothing worse than bringing the wrong person into your team. Yeah. yeah. It's like a cancer that metastasizes, right? It just gets bigger and it affects and impacts everybody. So now what our, our staff training looks like is like once a week, we'll generally meet for an hour. Now this is outside of... <clears throat> Bill doesn't have a patient and we're hanging out in his room talking about whatever. Right. But we do this one hour a week and there's times when it is directed. So like right now we're kind of revamping our assessment process and that's like collaboratively as a group, what are our big things? What are we going to focus on? And then a lot of times what I find myself doing is just probing, right? Like asking questions. Okay. Well, why did you say that? Why did you say this? And trying to bring us all under the same umbrella because we all have different experiences, right? We all work with different client populations. So trying to keep everybody, it's a big umbrella, but trying to keep everybody underneath it, right? right? Without cramping them. I want them to have their own personality, their own flair, but we all have to think to some degree in the same way. Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at now with regards to trying to you know, continue to educate. And it's just depth, right? It's like, okay, all the stuff, like once you're comfortable with teaching the exercises and interacting and writing a good program, now it's like just getting more into the, the weeds with stuff. And okay, why do you choose a half kneeling chop away from the up knee versus into the up knee? Yeah. You know, stuff like that. So um, really long winded, but. No, no that's, that's super, perfect. super helpful. Yeah. Mike. Cool. Well, one of, the, one of the struggles that we have sometimes uh, with new coaches is there's a lot of stuff, obviously they come in, a lot of stuff that they need to be good at and a lot of stuff that yeah. they are not that good at. Yeah. Uh, and it can feel overwhelming and it can be challenging uh, like for them to accept it, but also for us to deliver. How do you yeah. guys give feedback in a constructive way? Yes, man. And this is tough too, because uh, again, Ruth and I were kind of talking about this, but knowing the coach in front of you and knowing how they best receive criticism. Um, and, and I think one of the best things you can do early on is just say, nothing that I say is a personal attack on you, right? Like trying to disarm them right off the bat and just let them know like, look, I'm trying to give you feedback because I care about you and because I want you to be a better coach. So don't ever take this personally, like you're a bad person. 
right? That's not what I'm saying at all. It's like, this is something that you, I see you doing that I think if you improve upon it, it's going to make you a better coach. You're going to have better interactions. You're going to have a big, bigger impact with your clients and athletes. So I think that would be number one is trying to disarm them first, yeah. right? Because if their guard is up, immediately, if you guys are the bosses and you're like, hey, I need to talk to you, it's like, dude, they're sympathetic fight or flight before you even open your mouth. Right, you could be telling them, hey, you're gonna get a raise, and they're like, uh, what's coming next? Yeah. So trying to find a way to disarm them first, and then figuring out which way they are best at receiving feedback or criticism, right? Like some people, like they just want it straight up. Like, and, and, and it changes over time too, right? Like when I was a, a younger kid and I wasn't as comfortable or, or as confident in myself, like I took every kind of criticism negatively. And I felt like it was a personal attack on me versus now I'd rather you don't beat around the bush at all. Like just tell me straight up and we can move on and I can figure out what I need to do better. So I would say as a general rule, try and like be a little bit softer with young kids and young coaches because they are, man, they're just trying to figure it out. In a lot of cases, um, even if they walk around with like, you know, the big chest and a lot of swagger, it's like this really rough exterior, yeah. but it's not reflective of how they feel on the inside. Yeah. So that would be my best piece of advice is try and disarm them first and then just be really strategic and, you know, let them know, like, look, this is not a personal attack. It's something that I think, you know, it's just going to help you become a better coach. And I think that's one thing I always try and convey too is like, look, I wouldn't tell you this if I didn't care about you. Yeah. Or if I didn't want to see you grow. And so a lot of times if you come at it from that angle, they're like, oh, okay. Because we all know, right? Like, like every now and then there's just a giant asshole in our life that's just rude and they just want to beat you down for whatever reason. But by and large, the people that, that do like give us honest feedback, it's because they care about us. Mm. Yeah. You, know, you don't always want to hear it, but at the end of the day or, you know, when that person is not in your life anymore, more, you're like, damn. But that person really cared and they helped try and shape me and make me a better person. Yeah. Awesome. Ruth, you want to say something? Yeah, if I could just kind of yeah. add on to Mike. Um, you know, I think sometimes we try not to hurt their feelings and things. And so I try to, if, if I'm going to get after you about something, I'm going to try to give you a compliment also. And so, you know, it, I, it's, it's okay to, you know, they have to understand it's, it's okay to make mistakes. You know, everybody makes mistakes. I've been doing this 40 years and I'm still making mistakes. Bill might got to pull me over and say, you can't do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, I think you got to tell them direct and, and they got, they got to be tough enough to accept it. And I think sometimes, you know, we, we're, 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 we're so afraid of offending them or running them off or whatever that we don't, we're not, we're not tough on them. And, and I don't mean yelling and screaming at them in, in front of everybody or, you know, even in privately that's not, that's not that's not it but but it's it's you know you got to tell them true and you got to tell them hard because they got they got to accept it you know because you, you did this wrong right or you know whatever, whatever the case may be and so I always try to I don't know I guess soften it by giving them a compliment first maybe and then or or even at the end you know, give them, give them a compliment, but, yeah. but you got to tell them straight up, you know, this is what you did wrong. This yeah. was the shits. See? Yeah. And, and things like that. And, you know, if they can't handle it, maybe that's not the business for them. You know, cause you, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a weeding out process also. Yeah. You know, I want it to be tough. I get, you know, I get mad when they're not there all the time, Yeah. you know, and, and I, and because it's only, you know, it's 17 weeks out of your life. You can do anything for 17 weeks or whatever. Yep. Well, I forget how long the thing is 17, I think anyway, whatever it is. 
you know, so get your butt there. Yeah. You know, stay late and, and talk and discuss. Yeah. Do and, you find um, the, the whole staying late, talking, discussing, uh, being like being genuinely interested, do you find that that is something that can be cultivated or they sort of come with it or don't? Um, I'll, I'll give you my two cents. I think it's, that's like curiosity is kind of a harder thing to coach up, you know, like yeah. it's not that it can't be done, but like, I don't know. I just find that it's pretty rare that somebody comes in who thinks they know it all and doesn't want to ask questions and all of a sudden they change, you know, there are certain people, you know, it's like, but they have to be a pretty big person to be able to admit, wow, like I thought I knew all this stuff and man, I had no clue. Like, what I didn't even know. Like, I, I remember, I hope Bill hears this or watches this at some point because we had this intern. This was when it was just Bill and I, and this kid comes in and, you know, Bill was like, he's always onto something, right? So at this point we were really in like energy systems and, and this kid comes in first day and it was a Monday. So Mondays I worked till like five and Bill would come in after he got off his shift and come in and hang out. And so he starts, you know, giving this kid the up and down and, you know, so he's like, so uh, Bill says, well, what, how do you feel about, what's your confidence level of knowing energy systems? And this kid says, very strong. And Bill's like, oh, really? Yeah. He says, very strong? He's like, very strong. And I'm like, dude, this kid's done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> destroyed. Yeah. And he did for about the next 16 weeks. So it's like, you have to, I, I think you can do it, but it's really hard because it's not just a, it's not like a, a technical thing that you're lacking, right? Yeah. It's like an internal thing where you've got to be able to put your ego aside, humble yourself and say, man, I just don't know everything. And I need to keep asking questions and I need to keep digging deeper. And when I think I've got it figured out, that's when I need to try and blow it up and start over again. Like, I think that's the thing that's so refreshing about Bill is, dude, however many years later, he's still like blowing everything he knows up yeah. and trying to piece it back together with a better model. So I want to come back to one thing that you guys said, though, and that Ruth said that I think is very important. When it comes to feedback or when it comes to managing, uh, whether it's your employees, whether it's managing your members, one of the most important things you can do early on is set expectations. Yeah. 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 And this is something that, that I did, I think, a poor job of in the past. Um, it's something that I am always trying to do a better job of now because I find the worst thing you can do is not set a clear expectation because then ultimately if something goes wrong, it's you that is to blame, yeah. right? Like you didn't set the expectation or in my case, I didn't set the expectation. So uh, I always try and be very clear up front with our employees, with our staff, what we expect, the standards that we have at IFAST. I mean, our internship, before you even walk in the door, we've got like a 20 page document, right? That's literally just like a set of expectations yeah. from how we expect you to dress, how we expect you to interact with clients, how we expect you to clean the gym, so that it's very clear. And I think if you do that up front, then it comes down to, okay, does this person really get it? Do they want to uphold the standard or do they not? Yeah. And I think if you can set a clear expectation, if you guys are clear in what it is you want to get out of whomever it is you're interacting with, then it just makes your life so much easier versus if it's wishy-washy or you're not clear up front, I think you're just setting yourself up for a lot of pain down the line. I think that's extremely important. Uh, one of the things is we're, uh, we're now adding coaches to a system that we've understood intuitively for a while. So we're, we're trying to catch up with setting our expectations and setting up our education in a way that makes sense. So we have a system they can follow. If yeah. you were flying by the seat of your pants and didn't have that 20 page sheet of expectations, what, what are the minimums that you would set when someone comes in? The, the minimum expectations I would, I would start putting into play are, what I expect client interactions to be like, right? Your members drive your business. So if they are interacting with people improperly or they're not representing you guys at the highest level, that's a huge red flag, right? So they gotta have that. 
Uh, number two, not that we need like Brad Pitt working here. Obviously, I am not Brad Pitt, but it's like, what do you, what do you, what do you, how do you dress for work? Like sometimes people never got this, right? Like they don't know what it's like to be professional. So what is your, what is your appropriate attire? How often do you want them to shave? Piercings, tattoos, like all these things. Like, how do you want them to look? How do you want them to reflect your business? So that would be another one. Um, a third thing that I would say as well, and this may just be us, but like when it comes to how the gym looks, Jay calls it recruit ready, right? So in college sports, it's coming back to Roos world, but in college sports, if recruits are coming in, you want everything to look spotless and amazing, right? We need our gym to look as much like that as possible. Mm -hmm. Now you're never going to walk into iFast and you know, think it's a big box gym. It doesn't look like that. It's not shiny and chrome. You know, we've got barbells and dumbbells and all that stuff. I want it to have that gym feel, but I don't want it to be like a dingy, just dark place where you're probably going to get tetanus or MRSA or something, right? So it's like, I want that feel, but it's got to look clean, right? So if somebody new walks in the door, here's what I always tell my staff. Let's say somebody new walks in the door. They think they want to train at iFast, but there's nobody at the front desk. So all they do is they pop their head in. When they see the gym, is it clean? Does it feel like a place they would work out? And what is the music and the energy like, right? Do they pop their head in and think, yeah, I want to know more about this? Or do they turn tail and run? So it's like that visual auditory aesthetic. When they walk in, does it feel like a place where they would want to work out? And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I just know, like, I get on the guys sometimes because, like, Jay is obsessed with Britney Spears. So, like, it's like Britney Spears radio. So it's like Britney Spears and Shakira and Jay Love. I'm like, dude, like, nobody is hyped up to this. Nobody. I would rather just, like, techno, no words, something <clears throat> <clears throat> <Yeah. laughs> that gets people going, right? Yeah. I would rather have that than this. Yeah. Um, we also have some older clients, right? So like 70 plus years old. And sometimes it's just the two of them. It's a husband and wife. And they'll be in there and it'll be like big bop 60s. Yeah. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. You're catering to the, the population. But we also have to think if somebody new came in, would they come in and be like, man, I'm not, I'm not training doo-wop, BS, like whatever. So like those are things that, that are always first on my brain, you right. know, like, Client interactions, appearance, do they look professional? Do they look the part? What is the gym vibe? So like starting with that stuff because look, the skills, you can teach that. Yeah. Right? Like you guys can teach somebody how to squat, how to push up, how to lunge, whatever. You guys can teach those skills, but it's like some of those things that maybe they don't think about as being important to being a coach or to being a business, those things are critical to you guys. So those are some of the standards that I want to set early on. Cool. Thank you. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Um, so yeah. are you guys just never in a place where you have to hire without internship? I know you're now more established, but yeah. was there ever a period of time where it's like, shit, okay, things are just busy. We need someone in here. We don't have four months to get them ready. Yeah. So I think we've only hired two people that haven't come through the internship process. One guy was like a personal referral. Um, he started off great, but was a really bad hire in retrospect because mm -hmm. basically we got our boot camp off the ground and we were doing really well. And then he decided he was going to go open his own gym and yeah. try to take basically all of our boot campers with him. So again, that was, it wasn't a technical issue. Like maybe he didn't coach things exactly what I would have liked, but the chemistry and the cultural side of it was bad, mm -hmm. right? And the other guy was Ty, Terrell, and he was fantastic, right? I mean, because he was curious. Um, he'd studied under Lee, so we knew we wanted to get more athletes in here. He was great with speed work, so he was like a perfect fit, right? So, you know, I, I try and keep myself out of that situation, um, but I have had to do it in the past, you know? And, you know, generally, people that have worked here long enough, if somebody's going to leave, like we kind of know it's such a small business and we're all friends. Like 
you kind of know if somebody's like looking around. So yeah. it's like, okay, now I need to start thinking about like who's next in line. Yeah. Right. And as far as your internship process is, is, do you market that out or do you work directly with schools only? Like, how does that process look? Yeah, we haven't marketed it out, but man, uh, if you listen to my podcast with Pete Dupuy from last week, like, man, the internship game is dirty now, man. This is like serious. Like there's just so many, like every place that hangs up their shingle now thinks they're like qualified to run an internship program. Um, so Generally, we work directly either with a student or with the school. Um, we have not necessarily marketed it. We do have a page on our website that just talks about, you know, the internship and the process and what it looks like. But generally, it's direct contact. So if somebody knows of us or knows me or Bill or Jason or Jay or Danny or Eric or whatever, and they're like, oh, I want to go intern at that place. Mm -hmm. So generally, either the student reaches out um, and we have... Uh, made an effort to reach out directly to schools, especially like local schools and just say, Hey, you know, if you have an XI program, we'd love to take, you know, young, hungry coaches and trainers or people that want to be in the industry and have them here at IFAS. So I think if you've got personal connects, that's always the best way to go. But especially in a big city where you guys are at, I would look at like a, I don't know, like a three hour radius. The other great thing is you're in Toronto, right? It's not like you're in some three hour away, like whatever podunk city that nobody wants to come to. Mm -hmm. So I would like look at like a three hour radius, any schools that have an internship program, I'd be like, oh, hey, you know, here's, uh, here's our contact info. If you ever have students in your XI program that want to become trainers or coaches, we'd love to talk to them. But man, I think it's, it's such a good thing for your business. Um, it does feel like work initially, but man, it does a lot for you as coaches. It makes you better coaches yeah. because you're not, there's a different level and depth of understanding when you're teaching a peer versus when you're teaching a client or a member, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a different dynamic. They've got different questions. They're more educated. They're going to force you to really kind of stick to your guns in some cases or, or rethink why you do things. So lots of benefits to starting a program if you haven't already. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anything else from you guys? Um, I'm scrambling, trying to come up with some questions here, but uh, yeah. you guys, you've had some amazing information yeah, so we, far. We, we had 101 questions going yeah. again, but you just about yeah. answered every single one of them. Good, good. Yeah, that's the goal, man. Like, I don't know. It's I, the, the thing that Pete and I talked about, too, is when you started at IFAST, or when we started as a gym, it was just Bill and I, right? So there really was no internship process. It was like, hey, you're hanging out with us, and we're going to coach. And in between sets, we're going to school you on some stuff, and that's how it starts, right? But then as Bill and I, I don't – like, I still do stuff, but I'm not as – I'm not, like, on the front line of the internship anymore. Um, but especially as I came off the floor, that's when I got more serious about laying out, like, the curriculum and really, like, okay – like, I want Eric and Jason and Jay and Danny, I want them to, like, educate you guys while you're out there. But I was in charge of, like, the formal stuff, you know? So, like, okay, hey, we're going to sit down for an hour today, and we're just going to talk about squat. And we're just going to talk about hinging and cueing and why we do this and this, that, and the other. Um, so that's when it got a lot more serious. And this is what Pete and I were talking about. It's like, so IFAS has been open 10 years. CSP has been open 11. Like, there was no internship process at the start. Now it's like harder than ever to get interns, but the process is so much better. <laughs> you know? like it's literally like week to week, we've got goals, we've got specific things we want you to do. And so, but now it's harder to get interns than it was just because again, there's so much competition, so. I, I have a question. Uh, one of the yeah. things that we're kind of struggling with now is like, for example, I'm spending a lot of time on the floor, but also have new coaches to manage. And we're not at a point where I can like step back as yeah. much as we need to or spend time with the coaches. So uh, yeah. it, given like minimal time in a week, um, what, what are the most effective things? And this may seem a little abstract. Like what are the most effective things I can be doing to help coaches improve their, themselves and develop? Okay, so this is, this is actually a really 
good question. So what do you, what's the outcome? What do you need them to be able to do? Like, do you want them to coach exercises better or what do you want them to do? Now, I want them to be confident, like no one else in the building, them by themselves, confidently delivering the exercises and holding member, members accountable. Okay. So the first piece I think would be easier, right? Um, as far as how to coach an exercise, literally what I would do if possible, whether it's an iPhone or whatever the case may be, start documenting how you do stuff, right? So like back in the day, it was like with the e-myth, it's like write down all your procedures, Right. right. So it's like, okay, I'm going to hand write or whatever, document this. But it's like that always changes. Right. And who really wants to go look at this piece of paper? Yes. So uh, here's a book you should pick up. It's called Clockwork by Mike Michael Lowitz. And it's about like growing your business and scaling. Um, and it's about procedures. And so what you should do is anytime you coach a new exercise or coach an exercise to a new client, have your coach or assistant or intern, whoever it is, have them record you doing it, okay? And start building a database, okay? So it's like, hey, here's me teaching a plate squat. Here's me teaching a push-up. And then just create folders, whether it's on your computer, Dropbox, wherever you wanna have it, and just have squats, hinges, single leg, pushing variations, whatever, however you wanna break it up, and then just start uploading them in there, right? So now you're going, to, you're going to coach the exercise anyways, right? So now literally there's no time from you being off the floor. It's like, hey, you're coaching this. Hey, let's record this real quick. And then they upload it. And hopefully within a month or two, you could have 80 to 90% of your exercises covered. And then the real coaching for you is going to be the second part of that is harder. Owning a room, being comfortable, that sort of thing that's where you're probably gonna to have to let them coach. And this is again, what Ruth and I were talking about, either just as you guys came on or just before, but you gotta give them the floor. You gotta give them the floor, you gotta let them coach. You need to be like back in a corner, hanging out or talking to, preferably not talking to another client, but like just watching them and then giving them constructive feedback on what they're doing well, what they need to improve upon. And that's, that's the only way they're gonna get better at that piece, right? Like that just takes reps and it takes, it takes airspace for lack of a better term, right? Like we as coaches or owners of businesses, we take up a lot of the room because we are who we are. So yes. we have to kind of constrict ourselves so that they can expand and they can grow into their own kind of shoes as a coach. And right. so that's something that I think is really important. At some point you have to kind of just back off and let them get more comfortable, find their own personality, you know, kind of let their own personality shine and then kind of just see how things go from there. Really so, good point. Oh, sorry. That, that was a really good point is that, you know, Mike goes in, he can dominate the room just if for no other reason because he owns the joint. Yeah. And, you know, you got to you gotta back off a little bit and give those guys a chance to dominate the room also. Yeah. And I'll be honest, the first time you do that, it's harder than you think. Yeah. yeah it's really hard because like you see like an interaction or you see an exercise and you're like Ooh, oh i want to fix that you can't do that <laughs> another thing too right like just when it comes to uh like cueing an exercise like one thing that we always try and be cognizant of is not coaching over each other yeah. because i don't know what somebody else is working on right so maybe i come over and i give them a cue and it's it's the right cue and it gets what I want out of it. But the other coach was working on something else. Okay. So like, that's where too, like it's harder than you think, but yeah. you have to give them airspace and maybe it's 20, 30 minutes. Maybe it's an hour. I don't know, but like, let them try and figure out their own shtick, their own kind of appeal. And if you do that and then afterwards, then you do like a debrief and you say, Hey, look, I loved how you did this, this and this. Maybe ask them some probing questions like, hey, what were you working on here? And I think that's important too, is like trying to understand like, what is their thought process? Like that's something that always fascinates me. Like sometimes uh, like when Bill's doing an assessment or when he's coaching something or even one of our coaches, I'll just be like, hey, why did you give that cue? Or what are you trying to get out of that? And, you know, I, before I'm trying to predict, you know, like why are they doing that? But then I want to hear their answer. I want to get an understanding of their thought process because 
we all think differently too, right? Yeah. Like in a perfect world as a staff, we're all kind of thinking generally in the same direction, but you know, not everybody's going to think exactly like you do. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I love about Bill is sometimes, or in a lot of cases, we kind of end up at the same point, but we have vastly different viewpoints on how we got to the same conclusion. So right. uh, in terms of giving them the floor, yeah. Uh, now you guys have an internship process. So a couple of first couple of weeks, they've been getting client interactions. So the clients are getting very, very comfortable with yep. them. Um, how do you help? Because eventually I have to step away and I've developed deep relationships with all of our, our local members and someone else is going to step on the floor and, and start coaching exactly. them. How do you best set them up for success in that situation? And I, I think there's two parts, right? It's, it's, it's repetitions, right? Like just getting them, me and Ruth talked about this. It, you're never comfortable, right? You're never a hundred percent like ready. It's like getting married or having a kid or something like you're never a hundred percent ready to be on the floor and be the guy, but it's being thrust into that situation. But I would say the other piece of that too, is just being as comfortable as you can that you have prepared yourself with the knowledge, right? With the X's and O's that you're comfortable with the clients on hand because I mean, that's a big part of it too. Like I've been doing this a long time. There's still certain clients that they just kind of throw you off guard. (laughs) Their personality, or just the vibe, you know, the energy they're putting off. So it's like, put them in a situation where hopefully it's a client they know, somebody that's not like overly tasked uh, or or not not overly like complicated with regards to movement and that sort of thing. Like, I think like good wins, easy wins up front is huge to build some confidence, right? It's like with a kid, my daughter's eight. She's doing like addition and subtraction. If I gave her algebra, she wouldn't be successful. Yeah. Right? You build them up to it. So same thing. Try and give them some easy wins up front and then progressively expose them to more challenging situations or clients. Yeah. And then client side, how do you set the expectation with clients that, hey, you know, you're going to be working with so-and-so now um, and they're used to working with you, Mike. And, and the, yeah. how do you set that up? Man, well, there, first off, there's no good way to do that, right? Like, you can be, like, you can be smooth about it, but at the end of the day, it's not you. Right. So, like, one thing that sucks and you have to prepare yourself for is you could bring in the, the like, a most amazing coach of all time, right? Like, literally, they're ten times better than you are technically. But it doesn't matter because if it's not you, they're not going to be happy. Right. Okay. There's always a small fraction of that. So you have to be okay with that. Um, but with that being said, you just have to let them know, like, look, um, the business is growing. Like things are going really well for us. We're going to expand, um, to do that, to be a, a more successful business. Like I'm going to have to step off the floor some. So, you know, this person is going to be coaching you more. I'm going to do everything that I can to smooth the transition. You know, like you just kind of have to let them know, like, look, this is going to happen. This is something that's important to our business. We want to be successful. We want to grow. We want to take amazing care of you. Um, but I think one thing that, that is important, especially as a small business, you can't do this when you're a big box gym, but as a small business, is to just let people know, like, look, just because I'm not going to be coaching you every day doesn't mean I don't care about you. Doesn't mean I don't value our relationship. Like, if you need something, if you feel like things aren't up to snuff or you're not getting, you know, the TLC that you need, let me know, man. Like I care about you. You've been here with me since the start. Like I want you to have amazing results, but this is also something that I'm going to have to do going forward. If we're going to continue to grow and evolve our business. Right. I think, um, if I could just interject something, Yeah. I think you kind of get the client used to them by having somebody else coach an exercise, make them excuse to have hey, look, I'm going to have this guy, coach you or, or, you know, Mike, will you come over and coach this guy on this exercise? Yep. And they kind of get used to that a little bit. And so I know in, like in my situation, they'll ask me, can you watch this deadlift or something? And, you know, I've been around enough that people, you know, are okay with that. Yep. I'm, I may not be their everyday coach or something, but they're okay listening to me, Yep. you know, on something because, 
because you've kind of, kind of, I don't know how to say this right. Help me out here, Mike. Um, well, well, here's you kind of giving them license. You're, yeah. you're giving that coach a license to <laughs> to coach, and and you know, I know when I was coaching weightlifters, I always liked somebody else to coach them as often as I could. Just yeah. I just wanted to hear a different voice. Yeah. And and you know that's good because you may be telling somebody something for months and they're not getting it. And I come over and say it in a little bit different way. And all of a sudden they, it pops in their head and they go, Oh my gosh. And the guy comes yeah. over to you and says, Oh, I get how to do this deadlift now. And you know, Rufus yeah. told me to do this. And you know, it's the same thing you've been telling them, but <laughs> because a different voice said it, you know, you get, they, they, they get it. Right. So don't make your ego so big that somebody else can't step in and coach for you. And especially if you're in a situation like Mike, where you can go in and dominate the room, you know, just by your presence and everybody looks to you and um, you know, you got, you got to give them that little bit of a license and you, and you kind of, and you kind of kind of ease them in the client into having different people do that once in a while. It's not an everyday thing. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I think and, and I think used to it. I think the smoother you can make the transition, the better, right? So if it's like one day you're their coach and the next day somebody else is coaching them, it's abrupt, right? Like you wouldn't like that either, right? So it's like, for example, I think I can say this safely: like Jay is going to leave. Like Jay's wife got a job in another city, so we know Jay is not going to be here. Um, so like the guy that is going to take over for him. He's an intern for us before, but he's been gone for like two or three years. So, well, two years. So we're going to try and bring him back early, right? And get him on the floor and get people re-exposed to him because, man, I hate to say it, Jay's amazing. Like, we're probably going to lose people because Dave is an amazing coach. He's an amazing human, but he's not Jay. Yeah. Like, that's what it comes down to. Like, people want, this is a people business and it's about relationships. So... Um, the smoother you can make that transition and the more you can kind of let people know, like this isn't, it comes back to our talk about coaches. It's not personal, right? Like this is just something that is the best thing for our business. I still love you. I still want to take amazing care of you. I think this person is going to take amazing care of you. So, I mean, if you can do that, you hedge your bets as best you can, man. Just be prepared. Some people just because it's not, their coach, yeah. they're not going to like it. But for the most part, people are pretty, pretty cool with it. And I think, you know, if it is the right person and they're a good cultural fit, you'll have less issues than you think. Right, right. Yeah, cool. You can't but coach I mean, If someone does have an issue, like, because it's, it's not you, how do you handle that? Man, the first thing I'll try and do is redirect them to, like, a different time of day. That's right. not always like, okay, hey, you know, like, understand. Um, maybe they just don't jive with that particular coach for whatever reason. I'll try and redirect them. But, again, like, it's kind of no. Like, sometimes you might lose people, yeah. you know. It, there's nothing you can do unless you're going to say, yeah. I'm going to make an exception for this person for whatever reason. You know, like, it, it just happens, right? Like, when Ty left, we lost some people. You know, when Zach Moore left years ago, we lost some people. Like, it's always going to happen. Um, you just try and mitigate it as best you can. And Ruth makes a great point. Like, sometimes just moving pieces around and having somebody work somebody else's shift, you kind of let them know, like, hey, look, like, all the people that work here are great people. Yeah. You know, they're all great coaches. Different personalities, yes. Some people like to coach certain things more than others and vice versa. But it's like everybody here wants you to be successful. So if you can expose them to different people on your staff, you know, they just kind of know, like, look, this is the right thing. And some people, if it's just, hey, look, that's my coach. If it's, if it's not him, then it's nobody. Like, it sucks, but it may happen, you know. The, the earlier in the, in, the, uh, in the client's tenure that you start doing that, the easier it is. Yes. Also. Yeah. So as you do that from day one a little bit, then, then it's going to be a lot easier to do it later on. Yep. Right. You know, and you continue doing it a little bit. And, and that's not to say you don't 
you know, if you do it all the time, you just kind of get them used to it. And yeah. You're hearing somebody else or. Yeah. You know, you're gonna get every couple of weeks, couple of months. Yeah. Just letting them see a different face, hear a different voice and just understanding that there's more to your gym than one person, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cultural. It's a culture of coaching and of a community. And if you can do that, then I think you'll be okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Very much. Well, that was a ton of value. <laughs> no, good, man. Good. Yeah. Like, like I said, I told Lance, I'm going to start with the questions. Um, but if people come on that want to talk, like we're going to go through that. So I've got some more questions for uh, the next one. And obviously if you guys are there, you get priority. So I appreciate you coming on. This is fun. Thank you very so much. Thank yeah, you I've been so reading much. your stuff uh, since you did the shoulder saver stuff on T Nation. So this has oh, been a yeah. long while. A long while. Awesome, man. I love it. Well, thank you guys again for coming on. If you got any follow up stuff, put it on the Facebook page and I'll help you out, okay? All right. Take care. All right, All right guys. Have a great day. See ya. You too.